Welcome to Archival Adventures. I hope you can hear me. <laughs> um, hopefully there's audio, hopefully there's music, hopefully there's voice, and they're balanced relatively well, and everything's good. Do let me know if any of that is not the case. Uh, but welcome to Archival Adventures this Wednesday, November 8th. Uh, this, if you're unfamiliar, is a show I do once a week where voice is a tad quiet. Um, that was not the thought, but it, it worked. Um, oh dear. Uh, let's go. Is this better? Um, hopefully it's better. If I need to go further, let me know. But, uh, yeah. Um, hi. Uh, I'm Anthony Wright Day Hernandez. I'm the Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech, and this is a show I do once a week where I share materials from Special Collections and University Archives at Virginia Tech. Um, so, yeah, welcome in, everybody. Um, I see Key Squared is here. Welcome back. Thank you so much for the resubscription. Iron Trout, hello. Uh, Hannah, it is great to see you. Key Squared, I'm barely here either, so <laughs> it's good to see you. Hi, Fluid Anne. Hi, Lord Portico. Um, so I did, I did try boosting the voice a little bit. Let me know if um, if I succeeded or if it needs to go more, or or whatever. Um, but I'm going to proceed with our usual weekly ritual of, since we're paying attention to history on this show, looking at the history of the institution where I'm physically located. And uh, I, have a, I have a thing. Um, so many uh, there yeah that command um, and Hannah did did the audio get better or not I, I don't know because I can't hear it but uh, <clears throat> Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways we further acknowledge that the Morrill Land Grant College Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. Virginia Tech acknowledges that its Blacksburg campus sits partly on land that was previously the site of the Smithfield and Solitude Plantations, owned by members of the Preston family. Between the 1770s and the 1860s, the Prestons and other local white families that owned parcels of what became Virginia Tech also owned hundreds of enslaved people. We acknowledge that enslaved black people generated wealth that financed the predecessor institution to Virginia Tech, the Preston and Olin Institute, and they also worked on construction of its building. Not until 1953, however, was the first black student permitted to enroll. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to prosim that I may serve. In the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. So, that would be, um, you know, how we like to start things off. Since we want to pay attention to the history of the institution where, um, where we're, we're doing this stuff, the mic sounds really muffled. Hmm. It is the same mic I normally use. Um, I have made some adjustments and hopefully that will address the issue. I do not know. I did test today to make sure that audio should be working and it, it didn't seem odd to me, but 
I don't know what it sounds like when it gets to you. So um, I have I have made a few adjustments. Hopefully, um, hopefully that addresses it. Um, <clears throat> so today we're looking at uh, some military related things because Friday is Veterans Day in the United States um, and so we're going to be looking at materials from the early D. Gregory collection um, and early Gregory we will learn about who they are in just a moment but uh, um, basically Virginia Tech alum. They received the um, Medal of Honor and they were the only Virginia resident to receive the Medal of Honor during World War One. So I am trying, I don't know. Uh I have I, I'm, I don't know. <laughs> I adjusted. So I've, I've got a couple of places that I can adjust for the audio. Um, it should just be like, I had the same settings that I had last week. So I, I don't really know why it would be different today. Um, volume is good. It just sounds blown out. I will make it. Um, one moment. Uh, Da, 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 da. Wait. <laughs> okay, it sounds better now. I sound fine with my head turned. <clears throat> okay. Let me, is this, is this better? Maybe it is uh, the positioning of where the microphone is on my body. That's better. Okay, thank you for assisting me in um, figuring it out because I try. I really do try. <laughs> Oh boy. Um, okay, so this is what we're gonna look at today. Uh, and let me um who who is early Gregory and why are we looking at his materials? Uh and why are we looking at his materials specifically like in relation to Veterans Day? These are good questions. Um so early Davis Gregory. And here's the thing. I'm saying early, I do not know for certain. It could just be Earl. I, I have not seen anything that told me how it should be pronounced. I assume it's early, but I don't know. So I'm going with early. <clears throat> early Davis Gregory was born in Clayville, Virginia on October 18th, 1897. His father was a telegrapher for the Richmond and Danville Rail Railway. Uh, transferred to Chase City, Virginia as a dispatcher in 1901. Let's see, um, after his freshman year, Gregory entered the Fork Union Military Academy from 1912 until 1915. Uh, and then he joined Company E, 2nd Regiment of the Virginia Volunteers. Um, okay, so let's see. Uh, on October 8th, 1918, Gregory's unit was committed to battle at, um, am I supposed to pronounce this? <gasps> uh, 
uh, Bois de Calcevoy, north of Verdun in France. I think it's Bois de Consenvoy. But honestly, encountering that without any preparation, not the easiest for me. Um, during the outset of the United States involvement in World War I, on his first day of battle, Sergeant Gregory's unit was halted by incessant machine gun fire by German forces. Gregory abandoned his position and charged the machine gun, destroying it with a mortar round along with single-handedly capturing a howitzer and, a, and 22 German prisoners. His actions and overall valiance? I think, yes, they want valiance, but is that, I don't think that's spelled correctly. Um, earned Gregory the Congressional Medal of Honor, the only Virginian to be awarded the medal during World War I. Um, is that spelled correctly? <laughs> Whatever. Uh, so, uh, for his valor, he was awarded the Medal of Honor. Um, three days later, his unit was attempting to take an enemy trench line when an artillery shell landed on his unit, wounding him. Uh, he was hospitalized for six months, partly in France, before being shipped to Camp Lee, Virginia, uh, discharged April 25th, 1919. Four days later, he was awarded the Medal of Honor. Um, and then, after all of that, he came to Virginia Tech. Entered under a disabled veterans program, was accepted into the Corps of Cadets in, despite his war wound. Uh, served as Cadet First Sergeant during his junior year and Cadet Captain of Company A during his senior year. Um, class president twice and president of the student body his senior year. Um, so yeah, uh, so we're going to look at some stuff. The collection does actually include the Medal of Honor, except I do not have it today to show you because it is on loan from us to the Corps of Cadets Museum where it is on display. And um, I wasn't able to pull it back for the show today. So, we will explore and see what we have. Um, ba -ba -ba, document view. <clears throat> According to... Um, the notes that I was given for today, uh, folders 1, 2, 11, and 12 are pretty interesting, as well as um, photographs in box 2. So I haven't really explored this collection before. I don't know a ton about what's in it. Let's find out. Uh, folders one and two. I get really curious because I see and anything that catches my eye and I'm like, but what about that box? I should pay attention to the highlights sheet because we never have enough time. Um, Veterans Administration, National Guard files. Uh, 11 and 12. <clears throat> okay, let's see what all there is. We'll just start with box one folder one because it indicated that some of it was interesting. This uh, folder is supposed to contain publications. Wow. Uh, it 
I can't read it on the screen there, then I know you can't read it. Let me zoom in. See if that will make it better. There. Uh, publications about Gregory's World War I Infantry. Uh, 1st Virginia 29th Regiment includes correspondence. Okay. So we're starting off with the, we have um, a letter from Virginia Polytechnic Institute, Office of the President, Blacksburg, Virginia, in May of 1965. From This is from T. Marshall Hahn Jr., who incidentally, I think, didn't, wasn't it last week? Last week we looked at Hahn's papers. Um, <clears throat> Dear Mr. Gregory, a grateful VPI welcomes today one of its illustrious sons, who in the course of his life, among his other accomplishments rendered to his nation valorous service in con combat. Uh, it is a real pleasure to welcome you back on this glorious spring day, which symbolizes the spirit of hope in the world and inspiration to all men. Throughout your life, you have served as a symbol of dedicated service to all VPI people everywhere. Particularly grateful for your recent statement of generosity, uh, which you permitted me to reveal to the gathered assemblage today to the effect that you have bequeathed VPI uh, for delivery in the future, all memorabilia connected with your service career, particularly that associated with your receipt of the Congressional Medal of Honor and the medal itself. We cannot express here adequately what this sincere act of generosity means to your grateful alma mater. We may, blah, blah, blah. You may rest assured that this material will be kept in perpetuity to serve as a symbol for VPI people everywhere now and in the years to come. Okay, okay. Let's see. This is listed as chapter one. Um, so I assume this is part of a book. But I don't know what book. Hmm. We can dig in and investigate that in a minute, but... Ah. I have, uh... <laughs> I love the error. <laughs> the whole... Um, I believe... This is gonna be chapter one of They Had Served, Story of Virginia Tech's Medal of Honor recipients, because Early Gregory is not the only one. Uh, hi, Blue Rooster! Welcome. So we can take a look at that in a second, um, at least to get some narrative. But I want to look at some of the other stuff in this folder first and see uh, if looking at that is really what we want to spend our time on or if there's other interesting stuff in the folder that we might want to spend more time with. Um, I don't have a date on here. But, uh, <clears throat> this is a letter to the Secretary of the Department of the Army in Washington, D.C., from Early Gregory. Uh, Dear Sir, as you can see by the attached letter, I have willed my Medal of Honor and all materials per pertaining thereto to the Virginia Polytechnic Institute. In getting my house in order, I find that I am missing the Medal of Honor certificate. Um, I contacted my sister and she informed me that the certificate was hanging in the lobby of the hotel, uh, Gregory, that was owned by our mother and was destroyed during a fire of the hotel on April 11, 1936. As I wish to have a complete file on the medal, it would be appreciated if your office could furnish me with a duplicate certificate. Interesting. Okay, so the original certificate was destroyed in a fire... I wonder if we have... So, I'm sure that Virginia Tech has the certificate. The question of whether it is physically in the room with me today, I do not know the answer to. 
because it may be on display with the medal itself at the Corps of Cadets Museum, in which case it won't be here in the room with me. Uh, let's see. Mr. James Davis, Associated Industries of Alabama. Dear Jim, was glad to receive your letter of April 9th, 1946, and to know that you are planning on reorganizing the Birmingham chapter again. I'm very much interested in, I don't know anything about Associated Industries of Alabama, but there's a letter about that. Yeah, I'm sure he was able to get a copy, Iron Trout. Um, I just don't know physically <laughs> where it is located today. We are talking about the 40s. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's the 40s, not the 60s that that letter was from. Let me look at the finding it real quick. Um, discharge from the army. First retirement files. Medal of Honor files, programs. Signed invitation to Nixon's inauguration. We probably do or did have it. I don't think that I have it in the room. It seems like... So I knew the Medal of Honor was on loan. I'm curious. I'm guessing that there's some additional material that we could have pulled for today that we didn't and I feel like maybe we should have uh, but because there are other medals like his Purple Heart and a Mexican Border Service Medal that might have been good to bring out so there's a plaque I don't see the medal, like a certificate specifically called out separately from the medal itself. Um, there's definitely a plaque that is called out. Um, I'm curious, going to, going to do a little bit more poking and just a quick look to see. Um, what uh, non-public notes we might have. Because I know, I knew, like, the medal itself is on loan. The few Medal of Honors you've interacted with had the medal and the certificate framed as one item. Um, that would make sense. Uh, it's we've had this for years I've never I have never actually seen it because the whole time that we've had it it has been on loan to the museum I don't have any extra notes it doesn't look like I'm wondering if I can have somebody bring me this folder that I do not have that should have some other things in it because um, it would be useful to have and would be interesting uh We'll shoot a quick message and find out because
the other option is I could take a I could take a couple minutes of break at some point and run down and get it because it looks like despite not having the Medal of Honor to show off, um, if I could get that folder, we should have the Purple Heart and some other things to look at, uh, which would be good to have. So. I just I sent a note asking if somebody can bring it to me. Otherwise, uh, I could take a break in a couple of or in a little bit and go down and get it. Um, Virginia Tech alumni chapter of Birmingham was inactive. So this is during the war just ended. So this is dated 1946. So talking about World War II. Therefore, asking your help in reorganizing the Birmingham chapter. James Davis was asking uh, Gregory for help organizing an alumni chapter. Blue ribbon with an inverted five pointed star. Metal differs slightly from branch to branch, with the iconography differing. Slight differences in the star. Um, I might be able to find a picture of his. Um, I wish I wish I had the medal. <laughs> someday, someday it will be back where it belongs in our in our collections instead of uh, over at the Corps of Cadets Museum. Um, let's see. I'm trying to remember the exact dates. I can't, I want to say it was the 60s when the War Memorial Museum, or the when the War Memorial uh, was built, War Memorial Chapel, and then the um, there's like a memorial that sits on top of it. I can find a picture of that for sure. Um, Alumnus of VPI, you've contributed to the continuing improvement and development of Virginia's Lane Grant University. Uh, this looks like a fundraising letter. Um, yeah, alumni annual giving program. I want to... Looking to see... A lot of fundraising stuff. Virginia National Guard. <clears throat> Ooh. I'm I'm going through some things, but like I, I'm, I know I'm skipping through things quickly, but I'm looking for the more interesting items in the folder. We posit that the Cadets Museum is a good place for a military medal. I mean, it. Yes and no. <laughs> they have others. They have other things that they can show. So, um, yeah. Eligibility of First Sergeant Earl Gregory for appointment as Second Lieutenant Virginia National Guard. November 1916. First Sergeant Earl D. Gregory, Company E, Second Infantry, Virginia. I don't know what NG means. National Guard. Sorry, there it is. Virginia National Guard. Uh who was 18 years of age at the date of muster into the federal service of his company on July 1st, 1916, has been recommended for commission as second lieutenant of Company E, uh, and this office requests that a ruling be made by your department in reference to the eligibility. Okay. And the response... was Sergeant Gregory is not eligible for appointment as a commissioned officer of the National Guard of Virginia. Section 58 of the Act of June 3rd, 1916 authorizes the appointment of officers between the ages of 21 and 45. Um, and given that he was 18, uh, well, no, he'd be, yeah, he was still 18. So the answer was no.
<laughs> if you want a purple heart, all you have to do is travel back in time for World War One and do something valorous in the line of duty. Um, I mean, purple heart is get injured in the line of duty. Uh, Medal of Honor is valorous in the line of duty. Or, you know, something exceptional. Um... So yeah, it doesn't seem like he was allowed to move up uh, before the age restriction, which is fine. Let's see, after many years of work and study, I've completed and sent to Chase City the painting I have done for your ex exploit in the Argonne. Uh, for which you were awarded the highest decoration of your government. Painting. I don't know if I have... I don't know if we have the painting. Um... I'm curious. Travel card... Armed service aircraft. Let's see. Okay. 115th Infantry, 29th Division. I want... I'd love to see... There's got to be... Probably probably the thing I skipped at the very beginning uh, has the narrative of what happened. Um, it just seemed really long, and I didn't want to dedicate that much time to it if I could avoid it, but uh ooh <sighs> apparently the Richmond Times dispatch uh, I don't know the date of this issue. They left him out of a list of Medal of Honor winners. Um, lots of copies of things. I want to see... I'm going to skip to the next folder here in a second. John Coulter. Um, because I want I want a summary. That's what I want. I don't know if I'm going to find a summary, but I feel like I should. Two negatives of him wearing his Medal of Honor. Except not actually here. <laughs> this is what going through archives is like. I'm like, I, I want something concise. And I feel like it should be here somewhere, but that doesn't mean it will be. Uh... Hundred and sixteenth Infantry, first battalion or third battalion. Uh, I'm skimming looking for his name now. Not seeing it jumping out. At the beginning of this, I'm gonna go back because there was um there was this bit that maybe the beginning of this will give us the the summary that I'm hoping for. Let's find out. Chapter one. 
early Davis Gregory. Lasting symbol of pride and humor in the Corps of Cadets at the Virginia Polytechnic Institute. Uh, early D. Gregory was born October 18, 1897, the son of William and Pearl Gregory. His father was a dispatcher for the Southern Railway and his mother the manager of a small hotel where they lived. Early grew up in Chase City in rural Virginia along with two sisters. From 1904 until completion of his freshman year in high school, Early attended the Southside Academy in Chase City. Ooh, I got our response. Uh, uh, were after action reports? I don't think so. I think that was, um, sorry. I can find what we were looking at again here in a moment. Oh, where was it? Um, it's part of a book. So this is part of a book called History of the 116th uh, U.S. Infantry. So, not not after action reports, but uh, narrative of the thing. And I thought that this might just be easier to read as far as a narrative and more targeted to what I was looking for, so. Um, let's see. Uh, I want to know specifically about his time in the 116th, so. Went to military academy. It is unclear what Early did immediately following graduation in 1915. The summer of the next year, trouble on the Mexican border resulted in a call to active duty. Early reported for duty with E Company, 2nd Virginia Infantry Regiment, or on July 1st, uh, 1916. The regiment was first mustered for federal service in Richmond. While in Texas, Early was elected unanimously as one of his company's lieutenants. The Virginia Adjutant General's office turned down his commission over the objections of his company as he was only 19 years old and regulations required officers to be a minimum of 21. The regiment then spent seven months in Brownsville, Texas. There, it served as a deterrent against Mexican bandit incursions and conducted live fire trench warfare and chemical warfare training. In March 1917, the men were back in Virginia, released from active duty, having served nine months. One month later, they were called up again. Early reported to duty on April 6, 1917. The United States had entered World War I. Early left Virginia and went to Camp McClellan, Alabama. There, his regiment was considered or was consolidated with the 1st and 4th Virginia Infantry Regiments to form the 116th Infantry Regiment. Assigned to the regimental headquarters as the pl platoon sergeant for the Trench Mortar Platoon. Um... I don't know why the music stopped, but it's back now. <clears throat> At Camp McClellan, Early and his men were trained in marksmanship, the trench mortar, gas warfare, and use of the bayonet. Yes, the bayonet. This is World War I. Bayonets definitely still in use. Um, oh. Just thinking about gas warfare and the mustard gas from World War One, that 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 horrific. Um, this period of intense training lasted nine months. The new 116th Infantry developed a high degree of esprit de corps. That esprit was only heightened by the regiment's many battle honors. During the colonial period, it had been commanded by George Washington. During the Civil War, when the regiment achieved fame while under the command of Stonewall Jackson. Uh, 
Um, if I was the editor for this uh, manuscript, I would I would have something to say about that not being a complete sentence. Um, the 116th Infantry, known as the Stonewall Brigade, still exists in the Virginia National Guard and includes many Virginia Tech alumni. Uh, let's see. Early and his men moved in uh, moved in June 1918 to Hoboken, New Jersey, where the regiment boarded the USS Finland for France. The dangers of the trip became very apparent to Early. The day before departure, a liner had been sunk by a German U-boat lurking outside the New York Harbor. The Finland joined 27 other ships, including the battleship North Carolina, and 14 destroyers in a convoy across the Atlantic. Blue Rooster... Uh, what? <laughs> Hamilton. The musical's George Washington. I'm uncertain what you're referring to with regard to Stonewall Jackson being a traitor, uh, but okay. Um, I don't know specifically why they have... Yeah. No, uh, Jackson was Union, if I'm remembering correctly. Now I must look. But, nope, you're right. Honestly, growing up in Virginia, it's hard to remember who was Confederacy and who was Union. So, yes, he was a Confederate general. It's honestly not terribly surprising to have members of the Confederacy still recognized and honored in Virginia. It happens. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it's to the point now where I'm like, yep, that was a conflict. It was a long time ago and I forget who was on which side of it. Uh, uh, my brain is focused on World War One right now, though. Let's see. Okay. Um, the Finland joined 27 other ships including the battleship North Carolina and 14 destroyers in a convoy across the Atlantic. Why? I... I don't know why the music keeps stopping. That's odd. No, no, Blue Rooster, it's, it's fine. And my brain, I just... I remember visiting um, Manassas Battlefield as uh as a kid many multiple times and there being statues of stonewall jackson there um and so in my brain i i couldn't remember i remember seeing statues of him i remember learning about him and how heroic he was viewed and i couldn't remember which side he was on <laughs> That's one of the problems of growing up uh, here in the 90s, 80s and 90s, is they they uh, celebrated his military prowess while ignoring which side he was on. <clears throat> After 13 tense days at sea, they arrived in St. Nazaire Harbor in France, accompanied by French sub-chasers dirigible and American seaplanes. They sailed past the hulls of four ships, fallen earlier to enemy action. Early and the Virginians of the 116th Infantry Regiment soon moved from Saint Nazaire to what was planned to be four weeks of further training in Argeguet, France. 
It's my best guess at pronouncing it. Uh, the situation on the front cut, cut. The situation on the front cut their stay short. They marched to take up positions in reserve and eventually their place in the trenches of the Volche Center, or Volche Sector. Uh, the 29th Division, I know very little uh, about the actual like military movements of World War I. I'm realizing as I read these names that I have never seen before. The 29th Division, which the 116th Infantry was a part of, was known as the Blue and Gray Division. Okay. Uh, it was so named because the division's famous regiments had fought on both sides in the Civil War. And so appropriately, the division's shoulder patch includes both the blue and the gray. Between July 23rd and September 27th, 1918, the 29th Division was in the trenches of the Vosges sector, uh, holding trenches blocking the Belfort Gap. The Americans actually were in Germany, just north of the Swiss border. It was considered a quiet sector, but a quiet sector in World War I was a dangerous place. The newly arrived American troops were aggressive and impatient uh, traits, which did not tend to keep the were aggressive and impatient traits, which did not tend to keep the front quiet. Early's regiment was the first of the 29th Division to enter combat. In repulsing a fierce German attack, the brigade commander said of them, You damn Virginians fought like hell! The so-called quiet sector resulted in 744 casualties in the division. 116th Infantry moved from the Vosche sector to participate in the Meuse-Argonne offensive. Along with the rest of the 29th Division, they moved northwest and joined the American First Army. Oh, give me one second. There is a um, an archivist with a box for me. I looked at the finding aid and I was like, these really should be here. Have folders, they're boxes, and it's very confusing. And one of them was in Aaron's office, and neither of them are file. <laughs> I, I wondered how the purple heart was going to be in a folder and not a box but yeah. <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> thank you <laughs> what's in the box Hi, Lord Portico. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I have new things that just arrived um, that are called folders on the finding aid, but are, in fact, boxes. And we'll, we'll look at them in a second. Uh, <laughs> thanks for the box, disembodied voice. That was Archivist Kira, who will be on stream again at some point. Uh, in in the soon-ish near future. Um, I want to find the part about... his valorous actions. Okay. Because this is the part that I want to get read. <laughs> Kira was here? We should tell Alexi. She always seems to miss her when she's up. This is true. <clears throat> okay. So, I've advanced a couple of pages, but let's see. Uh, we are now... Early's Stokes Mortar Platoon was attached to the 116th Infantry's 3rd Battalion, which led the regimental attack early, and the Trench Mortar Platoon supported the Battalion... Battalionis... 
uh, right assault unit company one um, battalions. I'm, I'm uncertain on pronunciation. Once again, you know, I love sounding out words in not English uh, on on live internet for the first time I've ever seen them. Uh, the mission was to capture the enemy's three lines of trenches near uh, a Bois de Consavoy, Bois de Consavoy, a wooded high ground about three and a half kilometers to their front. Uh, the area was defended by the enemy's first Austro-Hungarian division. Over the last two years, the enemy had turned the area into a maze of entrenchments. Early and his men marched 73 kilometers the night of October 7th to arrive in attack position. The final segment of the march was through the wreckage of a previous battle with much barbed wire and craters and trenches in evidence. Darkness and the misty rain made the long march miserable. By midnight, they were in position. At 5 a.m., every artillery piece in the sector opened fire. The hills and valleys ahead became covered in clouds of fire and smoke as artillery shells rained down on the entrenched army. Simultaneously, whistles blew, signaling the Virginians to advance. Over the top, they went from the security of their trench line. Artillery shells landed 300 meters to their front, and the battalion advanced behind a rolling barrage. In 20 minutes, the enemy artillery reacted, hitting the 3rd Battalion with what was described as a hell of fire and hail of metal. But the advance did not halt or waver. The enemy's advanced trenches were taken after light resistance. The Austrians, in many cases, were still in their bomb-proof shelters as the Americans took the position. The second trench line was reached 40 minutes later and taken as it, too, was lightly defended. Following the initial success in the battalion attack, enemy artillery fire became more and more accurate. I Company, which uh, Early's mortars were supporting, sustained more casualties as bodies were hurled into the air. Um, then the enemy struck hard with artillery, small arms fire from the right flank, and even a squadron of enemy aircraft bombing and machine gunning the Virginians. Yeah, I think they, um, I think it's just a, a mistyping because this is definitely a rough draft, Blue Rooster. <clears throat> the battalion's next objective was the southern edge of Bois de Brabant sur -Nac. In Surnex, uh, Meuse Forest, and Malbrook Hill. Casualties in the advancing battalion mounted with shell fragments cutting men into pieces. By this time, the men had captured three ridge lines, and the enemy's main positions lay ahead. Early and his men were within 100 yards of these positions when heavy machine gun and uh, I'm unfamiliar with this word. Miniverfer fire stopped the advance. I wonder whether that is spelled correctly or is supposed to be something else. I honestly have no idea. Um, for two hours, the 3rd Battalion endured this punishment. The battalion brought up more men until the firing line beat down the opposing fire and then assaulted with fixed bayonets. I got it. it got it first time. I mean, it looked German. Miniverfer. Uh, I just have never seen that word before. Uh, <clears throat> As the enemy trench line was taken, heavy fire poured in from the enemy on the high ground of the Bois... Sure. Bois, Hormont, and Ormont Farm. In the heavy fighting that followed to control the enemy trench line, Sergeant Gregory played a critical role. The advance of I Company, with but one officer uninjured, against the heights of Ormont Farm. I love that there's an asterisk. I have no idea. Apparently, the asterisk is referring to Sergeant Alvin York who was a 82nd Division Medal of Honor recipient who became a national hero. The movie of his life starred Jimmy Stewart. 
The advance of I Company with but one officer uninjured against the heights of Ormont Farm was thwarted by a machine gun position protected by a rock ledge from mortar fire. Advised of this, Sergeant Gregory stated he would put an end to them. Early took five of his men forward, leaving them running and crawling between shell craters with Sergeant Gregory, armed with a rifle and a haversack of mortar shells. As they approached the machine gun position, Early said, I will get them. Moving forward, he threw a mortar shell, functioning as a hand grenade, and captured the three men manning the machine gun. His men were then joined by an officer who was immediately wounded. Early sent his five men back to the American limit of advance uh, with the wounded officer and prisoners and continued on as a one-man assault. Entering the enemy trench line, he followed it along the side of a hill. At the end of the trench, he captured a seven and a seven and a half centimeter mountain howitzer. Farther down the trench line, Early spotted an enemy officer running down the hill. Gregory then advanced alone up the hill, looking for the enemy officer's men. At the top of the hill were three dugouts. There, Early kicked open a door and using a mortar shell as a threat, captured 20 soldiers. As he took charge of the prisoners, an enemy officer attacked him. Before the other prisoners could try to overwhelm him, Early fired his pistol, killing the attacking officer. Under Early's direction, the 19 remaining enemy lined up and marched back to American lines. These courageous acts resulted in Gregory receiving the Medal of Honor. The battle was far from over. On the following day, heavy fighting followed a determined counterattack against the 29th Division by units of the 1st Austro-Hungarian Division, 32nd and 228th German Divisions. Repulsing the attack, the Virginians continued their advance, reaching the clearing on the north side of the Bois de Consenvoy woods. Uh, on October 11th, the 116th Infantry made three determined yet unsuccessful efforts to cross the clearing and take the enemy trench lines. The fire from the enemy along the road was severe. A shell during this action landed amid Sergeant Gregory and... Okay, so this is the asterisk that I was supposed to go to before. Landed amid Sergeant Gregory and four men. Two were killed outright, and Gregory and the other soldier were wounded. Uh, and it was supposed to be clarifying that the Ormont farm was, was in the French sector, but the 3rd Battalion commander ordered its capture. I don't know. This is clearly a draft of a book chapter. I'm sure it got cleaned up before the book was published. But anyway. <laughs> you didn't know that you could uh, use a mortar shell as a threat? Except in video games? <laughs> or that you could... Uh, with one mortar shell, you know, uh, just take over the entire enemy position. Um, it's it's really cinematic the description of, of what he did. I wonder if it, I wonder if um, I wonder if his actions were ever made into a movie. Oh, using it as a grenade, yeah. Um, apparently, it is a real thing you can do. <clears throat> okay, so let's see. Discharge from the army. We could look at that, but we could also, let's see. Lots of stuff about the Congressional Medal of Honor. Hey, look, I don't have the medal itself, but I do have um, a lovely program that shows what one looks like. Um, that said, I have some actual things. Don't try it at home, though. <laughs> yeah, uh, probably some things mentioned on today's stream that you definitely should not be trying at home. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> don't, don't, uh, storm German lines in World War I, um, by yourself at home unless it's in a video game so 
so here's a box that I didn't have with me. That I was like, hmm, we should maybe have this box with me. Do you think? <laughs> You'll try not to do that. Hey, look, it's a certificate to accompany a US Medal of Honor. Also, a purple heart. Oh, hi, Raiders. Welcome in, 16-Bit uh, Eric. Welcome, Whimsies. It is great to have you joining us. Um, hello, and uh, I am Anthony Wright de Hernandez, Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. Um, you probably better know me as Rogan27 um, across the Twitcherverse. Uh, this is my Wednesday show where I share materials from Special Collections and University Archives at Virginia Tech. Uh, live on stream. And today, uh, since Veterans Day is coming up in a couple of days time, we're looking at materials from the early Gregory collection. Um, and early Gregory was a World War I uh, Medal of Honor recipient, uh, alumnus of Virginia Tech. And um, so yeah, we're, we're taking a look at some of his stuff here on stream today. <laughs> Don't ask what happened to the other 26 Rogans. Um, indeed, indeed. Also, if anybody here wasn't already following 16-Bit Eric, might I encourage you to do so? 16-Bit uh, Eric is a wonderful, wonderful human who um, has a absolutely wonderful uh, community known as the League of Whimsy and um, regularly pops in here on Wednesdays and honestly it's just a great place to hang out and I encourage you to um you know spend a little time over there if you don't already 11 out of 11, out of 11. greatest day in the last 49 years <laughs> oh wait what oh 11 11 um is veterans day yes but it's also Iron Trout's birthday. Happy early birthday, Iron Trout. Um, okay, I'm gonna read. I, I, thankfully, um, Elixir was able to bring me some boxes, or I was. I was actually. I was getting ready to like take a break and go and find these boxes myself because um, they seemed. You know, like things that we should have, uh, but I didn't have. Um, so this is a certificate. It's mounted to some like paperboard, but it is a certificate for United States of America Medal of Honor. The United States of America to all who shall see these presents greeting. That's such weird phrasing to me. Sorry. Uh, to all who shall see these presents, greeting. This is to certify that the President of the United States of America, authorized by Act of Congress March 3rd, 1863, has awarded in the name of the Congress the Medal of Honor to Sergeant Early D. Gregory, Headquarters Company, 116th Infantry, 29th Division, for conspicuous gallantry and intrep intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty in action with the enemy at Bois de Consenvoy, north of Verdun, France, 8 October 1918, given under my hand in the city of Washington this day of... this day of... Well, it's signed, but not dated. Uh, because this is where the date it was being awarded would be. Um, we do know that this is a replica. Uh, this is a reissue of the certificate um, because the original one burned in a fire. And, and it does say that at the bottom. It says, this certificate replaces the original signed by President Woodrow Wilson, which was destroyed by fire. Um, and this one is signed by Lyndon Johnson. 
So even though it's not dated and it is a reissue, it still has the president's signature. Um, we've thrown open the door and yelled, special delivery! Arms full of archival materials. Yeah. <laughs> November 11th is Remembrance Day in Australia. We remember those who have lost their life in service to Australia. Honored by a minute's silence at 11 a.m.? Detective Zen, I didn't know that. Uh, so this is the closest that I have to showing you the actual Medal of Honor on stream, because as I noted, the um, Medal of Honor itself, which is part of this collection, is on loan to the Corps of Cadets Museum and therefore not physically in my possession today. I do, however, have a purple heart uh, that is in this collection. And inside the little purple heart case is a purple heart. Um, let's see. I've got... I can put it on a, a dark background. We can see which, which contrast shows up better. Um, let me zoom in on this. So if you've never seen one before, this is what a purple heart looks like. The actual like award um, that is given for being injured in the uh, conduct of your duties. And on the back, it says for military merit, early D. Gregory. Um, I'm not sure where in the collection or whether the collection includes the information about the issuance of the Purple Heart. We did see... Um, Yeah, I don't, I don't see that it's called out. So maybe we'll find it. Maybe we won't. But um, after the events uh, at um, Bois de Consenvoy that he was awarded the Medal of Honor for, um, he was later uh, injured in a, a, a subsequent. Uh, where'd it go? Three days after he single-handedly captured a howitzer and 20 German prisoners. He and his unit were attempting to take an enemy trench line when an artillery shell landed on his unit. His leg got hit with shrapnel and he was hospitalized for six months. Uh, get, giving him the, the Purple Heart, because if you're injured during the course of your military, uh, like, active service, like, he, he was injured during battle, which is what gets you the Purple Heart. I'm trying to see if there are gooder, gooder angles, better angles. Uh, I don't know that there are, but you can see... It's a very, like, um, revolutionary style. Who is on the Purple Heart? I've never actually looked up to see. Does anybody know? <laughs> After? That's like before, but much later. <laughs> right. Hi, Concilians. Um, anyway, that's that's what the Purple Heart looks like. There's also um, the bar here. So the there's the ribbon with the actual like metal, which would be worn for like super special occasions, things like that. But 
the regular uniform where you see like on the left breast uh various like colored rectangles that signify all of the awards that the person has gotten um, that's what the purple heart is in there it's the two little white bars on the sides with a purple in between them <laughs> a much gooder angle <laughs> right um so that's in here let's see what else we got Whoop. i have a I have something that is meant to be holding something. I wonder if that is supposed that yeah, I I'm not sure. I have an eagle that appears to want to be mounted on something. Was this supposed to be on here? I don't know. I don't know where this was meant to be. But um probably Washington. He's the one that established the award. So uh, it, you're probably right then, Blue Rooster. I would have to look to confirm, but um, it probably is. So we've got two awards in here. They both have this green and gold uh, ribbon. It looks like they're both the same thing. Uh, just... We have two of them here. For service on the Mexican border. The purple ribbon on the right, beside the medal, is the one for you to wear for your daily wear medal bar. Ah, oh, so this. Here, we'll, we'll look at. So this is for the daily wear medal bar? The tiny piece up here is called a mini ribbon. It's meant to be worn in formal dress that doesn't require the full metal. Ah, that is super useful. Thank you for the clarity. I recognized that that was, but I hadn't recognized that this was and it makes more sense to me now because I was like, this seems awful small for what I was thinking of of the, uh, uh, the medals on the left breast. Cool. Can I can officially confirm it's George Washington. Thank you. So we'll look at the front and back here. So these are uh, Mexican Mexican border service medals. Um, which there was mention of. So this was just before this was before uh, World War One. So this was in the narrative we were reading, uh, I want to say 19. 14, 15-ish. I can find it again if I need to, but um, I've never seen these medals before. The service on the Mexican border medals. Uh, we also have the the ribbon that goes with it. Did he hang out with good old Teddy Roosevelt? Um, I do not know. I wouldn't be surprised. I know we have some stuff in our collections from people who definitely did. But I don't know for certain that early did Mexican border. It could be during Pancha Villa. It's definitely during Pancha Villa time. Uh, that is that is one hundred percent the time frame. Um, 
because there is mention of Pancha Villa in, in the documents here. Um, I don't remember where I saw it, but I definitely saw Pancha Villa mentioned. Fork Union. I could zoom out. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm not sure where it is. I'm not going to dig forever to find it, but there was definitely mention of Pancha Villa. <laughs> I just can't remember where I where I found that. Um, I mean, it was, it was in this folder that we were looking at before, but, ah, it's in this article. Uh, when Pancha Villa, a Mexican rebel, raided Columbus, New Mexico, on 9 March 1916, killing 17 Americans, Congress pressured President Woodrow Wilson to react. Um, after obtaining the reluctant approval of the Mexican government, Major General John J. Pershing was sent across the border with a 15,000-man punitive expedition. His vanguard set out on 15 March, and the regulars would remain on Mexican soil until the following February 5th. Uh, to help meet his uh, this crisis, New Secretary of War Newton Baker shepherded the National Defense Act through Congress. The act not only provided for improvements designed to expand the Guard to 450,000 men and the regular army to 223,000, but allowed for mobilization of the bulk of the mobile reserve force to help protect the border. Virginia received a telegram from the War Department shortly before midnight on 18 June 1916 informing the state of the plan to mobilize and notifying the governor that the Commonwealth's share in this exercise would be two regiments of infantry, the four existing batteries of field artillery, plus the signal and field hospital companies. The adjutant general immediately notified unit commanders and issued the necessary general orders directing the companies to report to their home armories and await further instructions. Uh, the camp of instruction for 1916 had already been completed and had review, reviewed and uh, blah, 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 reviewed the newly deployed state mobilization plan, so the units were far more prepared than they had been re had been in 1898. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Um, so that was the last deployment to the Mexican border prior to uh, heading to Europe for World War One. Um, based on the timelines that were in the documents here, uh, Gregory was in uh, in service patrolling the Mexican border um, for multiple deployments and multiple years prior to that one. <clears throat> oh, thank you, Hannah. The medal recognizes those military service members who were assigned to the U.S.-Mexico border at the period of time when the U.S. was on the verge of all-out war with Mexico. The U.S. was then engaged in the Pancho Villa Expedition, a military operation conducted by the United States Army against the paramilitary forces of Mexican revolutionary Francisco Pancho Villa. Ooh. Oh, we have a lovely photograph. Uh, let me zoom out so that we can get a better... This is actually uh, quite a nice photo of early Gregory. In um, Quite Studio, New York, was the name of the photography studio that took this photograph. It is signed by Gregory. And I, not a hundred percent certain. I think, isn't that a Corps of Cadets 
uniform that he's wearing. Uh, I think it is. I don't think that that's a like official military uniform. I think that's a Virginia Tech uniform. I highly recommend Mike Duncan's Revolutions podcast series on the Mexican Revolution. Thank you, Blue Rooster. Yeah, that's one that I'm not super familiar with, so that I would I would appreciate learning more. This is uh, from the school he attended before World War One, Fork Union Military Academy. The Fork Union Military Academy Alumni Association recognizes early er, Earl. Okay, so here it is with without the E on the end, which makes me wonder if he pronounced it Earl and not early. Uh, but Earl D. Gregory for his devotion of time, thought, energy, talents, and substance in the Academy as distinguished alumnus uh, this is 25 April 1971. Cool. I don't know where Fork Union is located. It's not one that I'm immediately familiar with. Uh, yeah, Iron Trout, um, the styling of it felt really familiar to me. Uh, which is why I think it's a Corps of Cadets uh, a uniform from Virginia Tech. Rather than a, an actual, like, military uniform. <laughs> Uniforms change constantly. I mean, that is uh, definitely something that gets depicted in, uh, in Star Trek, for sure. Um, all right, we've got a ring. And this ring, I honestly don't think I've ever seen a ring as like worn smooth as this. You to see my dry, dry fingers. Um, this ring is so smooth. Like you can see there's supposed to be detail on it, but wow, is it smooth. It, this is a Virginia Tech class ring. Um, <clears throat> I would imagine that it is gold. So it, it is engraved on the in the inside. I don't know if I'll be able to show you the engraving. You can sort of make out a little bit of it there, but it, it's engraved with his name. Early D. Gregory, or Earl Gregory, uh, on the inside. Um, yeah. So it's a, it's a Virginia Tech class ring. Um, but wow, super worn. Uh, and I keep, I zoomed in really close and, and then you know, it keeps pulling it out of shot because I'm too close to stay within the shot super easily. Do not let people with dry fingers hold. <laughs> no, it said it, it was his name. Um, interesting. Yeah, I've never, never seen a ring that was that that worn down. until today. I mean, now I have. Oh, I was like, I wonder what this stand is for. I have the stand that the Medal of Honor goes on. <laughs> Even if I don't have it here. <clears throat> I do have another medal, though. Oh, no, this isn't a metal. This is a finial. This is a, um, 
like a flag topper. I'm trying to look and see. I don't know what what this was named as on the finding aid, but this is a um. It could. It's the right uh, gauge. So yeah, that could be on that stand. I'm not gonna screw it into it, but um, I wonder if this is what they labeled as cross of military service given by the United Daughters of the Confederacy. Except this says Veterans of Foreign Wars of the United States. So this is VFW. Ah! It just says Veterans of Foreign Wars. That's all it says on there. Um, but yeah, it looks like it's got a little screw. On the bottom, like this is meant to go on top of a flag. quite heavy. Uh, what else we got? What else we got? There's a lot of stuff in here. I, I'm, I wonder if, I wonder how these got missed. I wonder if uh, it was just assumed that because the metal was on loan that the entire box was on loan. All right, I'm going to zoom out. We have uh, Republique Francaise, Medal Militaire, Militaire, Medal, Medal Militaire, Military Medal, sorry. Uh, Valor, Discipline, or Nom du President de la Republique. Le Grand Chancellor de l'Ordre na, National de la Légion d'Honneur à uh, délivrer le présent brevet uh, M. Gregory. And between water damage and time, there is more that was written here, and a lot of it has has been lost. Anyway, um, in the name of the President of the Republic, uh, the Grand Chancellor of the Order of the Legion of, or the, uh, the, the National Order of the Legion of Honor, no, The Grand Chancellor of the Order, the National Order of the Legion of Honor to, deli to deliver Anyway. He got an award from France. <laughs> that I, I did my best, but also I took one year of French in sixth grade. No, fifth grade. No, I don't know. I was, I was really young. <clears throat> it was before high school. Congressional Medal of Honor dinner. Uh, Hotel Waldorf Astoria, New York City, Thursday, October 1st, 1964. They, they decided that font and style were more important than being able to read what was written. 
honored guests. We honor tonight, through the Con Congressional Medal of Honor dinner, the 3,000 men living and dead who have received the highest honor the nation bestows in time of war for service to the country. Beyond the call of duty, these gallant heroes offered their lives in stirring acts of valor to protect and preserve the freedoms that bless our land. All Americans shall be forever grateful to them. Impress on the mind of every man from the first to the lowest the importance of this cause and what it is we are contending for. Uh, General George Washington, Valley Forge, 1777. Uh, so then there's a program. The master of ceremonies was Raymond Burr. The national anthem was performed by Eileen Farrell. Invocation from the Reverend Edward, Edward L. R. Elson, the National Presbyterian Church of Washington, D.C. The Pledge of Allegiance read by Lieutenant General Robert W. Porter, Jr., Commanding General, First Army. Uh, speakers. President, Congressional Medal of Honor Society, General Early G. Wheeler, Chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff, Honorable Robert F. Wagner, uh, Mayor of City of New York, uh, Dr. Kenneth D. Wells, President of Freedoms Foundation at Valley Forge, Honorable Joseph J. Foss, Commissioner, American Football League, I, all of the others made sense to me. Why was the commissioner of the AFL speaking at this event? Uh, presentation of special guests, Honorable Harry S. Truman, Honorable Dwight D. Eisenhower, Entertainment, Leslie Uggams, Gordon and Sheila McRae, Congressional Medal of Honor, Honor March, written and directed by Lieutenant Colonel Samuel Laboda, Leader and Commanding Officer, the United States Army Band, Music, the New York Naval Base Band, Director, Lieutenant, Junior Grade, G.T. Bowen. Key Squared, is that, is that true? Did, uh, had Joseph Foss won the award? himself at one uh, was he a, an oh awesome that that then it makes sense that he would be a speaker because until until then like in, in, without that piece of context I didn't understand why the the commissioner of the American Football League would have been speaking but if he was a Medal of Honor winner then it makes much more sense or one I you don't really win the Medal of Honor. You earn the Medal of Honor. <laughs> you are granted it for having done something exceptional. He was a pilot in World War II. I see. Ah. <clears throat> uh... I'm not going to read all of this. <clears throat> because that's a lot of text that is very stylized, but um, American Freedom Center. This is a really interesting program. It's very stylistic. Quite, it, it's a good program. Uh, if very, very difficult to read because of the font they chose. I understand why they chose this font, but also it takes a lot longer to read. This is a list of sponsors. I'm not, I'm definitely not reading the list of sponsors. Um, to personally understand and maintain the American way of life, to honor it by his own exemplary conduct and to pass it 
intact to succeeding generations is the responsibility of every true American. Okay. Uh, there is a mounted print of the bronze plaque in the Commandant's office in Patton Hall, now Brody Hall. I don't know whether this plaque is still uh, on display, but apparently at one point in time, Virginia Tech, or well, in 1972, Virginia Tech had this plaque on display in what was Patton Hall and then became Brody Hall. Uh, early Davis Gregory, 1897 to 1972, awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for conspicuous valor and intrepidity beyond the call of duty at Bois de Comte Savoy near Verdun, France, 8 October 1918, enrolled at VPI 1919 to 1923, President of the Corps of Cadets and ranking cadet captain. This memorial, placed by his classmates, honors him for superior leadership, high courage, dedication to duty, gallantry, and devotion to alma mater, state, and nation. Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University, 1972. Um, yeah, not the most accessible font, Blue Rooster, that's for sure. Uh, citation L'Armée? Army Citation? Sergeant Gregory, comma, Earl. I'm not even going to try to read this because not only is it in French, but it is in cursive that I would find difficult to read if it was in English. And it's in French. Um... But a, a, another citation from France. Uh, a lot of these are mounted on paperboard, which if they came to us that way, we weren't going to remove them. Why didn't they consider the internet when they handed out these awards after World War I? I, I don't know. One would have thought that maybe they would have considered that these would need to be shown by a camcorder on a live internet stream. I mean, it, it, did they not know about the internet in 1918? Uh, République Française, uh, Ministère, Ministère de la Guerre, uh, Croix de Guerre, Loi du uh, 8 Avril. I'm not even going to try and say 1915 in French. Gosh, that is just a bit further than my brain will remember at the moment. Anyway, uh... <laughs> Uh, let's see. Just another citation. Um, the Order of the Army for the campaign 1914 to 1918. So apparently France was very happy with uh, with what he did during World War One. <clears throat> Service award. This certificate is awarded to Early D. Gregory by the Veterans Administration in recognition of 35 years of faithful service to the United States government given at Tuscaloosa, Alabama, this first day of July, 1962. From the Veterans Administration in 19... Yeah, 1962 is when that was... Okay, Ladies Auxiliary of the Veterans of Foreign Wars of the United States. 
Citation of Merit, issued to Early D. Gregory in recognition of meritorious service. Uh, Commonwealth of Kentucky. Huh. I, I don't particularly know why the Commonwealth of Kentucky decided that they needed to, but I don't see why not. Here's a photograph of, uh, I'm guessing, of Gregory holding his Medal of Honor. Someday, uh, I will actually have the physical Medal of Honor from, uh, it'll be back from loan and when it is, we'll show it on, on screen. Time is now 4.23 and I know we're having fun, but the end of stream is night. Thank you, Hannah. Um, Veterans Advisory Board, Commonwealth of Virginia. Ah, here we go. I certainly can't read this one. I can't even begin to try and pronounce this one because this is, this is, um, I, I am not conversant with how to pronounce Cyrillic letters, but, uh, this is a Russian metal. <laughs> um, to early Gregory, I see 1914 mentioned. 1914 slash 1918. Uh, Nicola. So you're guessing Nicola? <laughs> you can't read this one. Funny thing to put on a certificate. I can try and get, um, oh. It's been a while since I did this on stream. Let's see. Let's see what I can do. Uh, translate. Um, I wish to detect. I wish camera. Okay, let's go. All right. <clears throat> His Majesty Nicholas I, by the grace of God, King and Lord of Montenegro, uh, the, the, it translated it as, it is benevolent to distinguish Gregory, comma, Earl D, uh, Sergeant. Um, So it, it it didn't translate to Arjan, but I would take this as um, no, not that. Uh, essentially, a uh, silver medal for military merit in 1914 uh, for courage. For courage. Um, that's the best that I got from... Um, I do think that it is probably in reference to Tsar Nicholas. Interestingly, that it is uh, specifically in the role of King and Lord of Montenegro, uh, which is what is here. At least according to um, 
the Google Translate app on my phone. Which generally does okay with, with this kind of quick glance at stuff. Hmm. We've almost looked at everything in here, so... Um, we have a Cross of Military Service. Certificate of Award. This is from the United Daughters of the Confederacy. Oh, when was the the uh, this one issued from Montenegro? Um, looks like 1919. It looks like uh, the. 31st of May, 1919. If I'm reading it correctly. Um, so we've got the Daughters of the Con United Daughters of the Confederacy giving an award. Faithful and honorably served the United States or its allies during the World War, and whereas he has a he is a lineal descendant of George Luther Davis, who served honorably as a private in Company D, 20th Virginia. Uh, you know, the Daughters of the Confederacy continuing to honor former Confederate soldiers and their descendants. Um. Let's see. This one I have to zoom out for. In the name and by the authority of the Army and Navy Legion of Valor of the United States of America, to all whom these present shall come greeting know ye that Earl D. Gregory having been awarded a United States Medal of Honor for distinguished gallantry in action in accordance with the acts of Congress and having rendered faithful services in maintaining the honor, integrity, and supremacy of the United States of America was received as an original companion of the first class of the Legion of Valor of the United States of America on the 22nd day of December, uh, Anno Domini 1919, in testimony whereof the names of the Commandant, Adjutant, and the Seal of the Order are here, hereunto affixed given at Brooklyn, New York, this blank, oh, sorry, this first day of June in the year of our Lord, 1920. Uh, George W. I'm uncertain. The... Be something. I don't know. <clears throat> and John Bronson. I would have to confirm. I'm not going to try to dig too much into that signature right now. <clears throat> anyway, interesting. Your theory is that he had abdicated as Tsar of Russia by 1919, so his only title was King of Montenegro. I don't know. I don't know enough about the history of... Um, uh, Russian rulers to confirm or deny that, but uh, sure. I was not expecting um, King of Montenegro to be the the, the notation on there. Anyway, um, I, I, I sadly do have to be ending today, but you know, I'm just going to throw the purple heart up there because it's kind of the most interesting thing that we saw. Um, I do, I did, I never got to, uh, there were pictures. There were photos. And I never got there. 
I'm gonna throw one up. We'll look at one photo. If I can find it real quick. I mean, we did look at a photo. But this is the one that I'm gonna just throw up here. No, stay with us forever. <laughs> um, there you can see Gregory shaking uh, John F. Kennedy's hand. Which, um, he was, he, he did meet Kennedy. I know that much. Uh, I don't remember. I know somewhere in here there is a signed invitation to President Nixon's inauguration. Um, anyway, uh, he was considered a relatively important personage. I don't know. This photograph was in relation to a ceremony that was held, but I'm unclear on what ceremony it was. Um, I would have to do more research, and there's documentation in this collection that would allow me to do that. But sadly, we're out of time for today's exploration. Uh, if people want to know more, you can feel free to reach out and we can find information for you. Um, or you're welcome to stop by uh, the Newman Library on the campus of Virginia Tech and have a poke around the collection yourself. If you do stop by, you'll even be able to actually see this purple heart in person. Touch it with your own hands. Uh, read these documents in person. <laughs> that's what them being in the archives allows is that people from the general public can come in and access and use these things um, <laughs> anyway uh, let's go ahead and um, <clears throat> wind things down because uh, I do need to end for today next Wednesday for Archival Adventures we are going to be looking at um, items related to Buckminster Fuller's World game, which is sort of like, as I best understand it, uh, kind of like the Model UN, but on steroids. Like, like the Model UN, but for economics and on steroids. I don't know. I don't know much about it, but we're going to learn about it next week because <laughs> we got some materials about uh, Buckminster Fuller's world game, and, and that's the focus of next week's episode. So um, let me see where we're going to go today. Who should we go and say hello to uh, now that it is time to be moving along. Um, no, 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 no. Ah! Um, I go to look for things in your other channels. Now you have a mental image of the UN on steroids. <laughs> um, Oh dear, um, well, we got potentially a kelp forest. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think today's a, an aquarium day. The kelp forest appears to be very busy uh, with many, many fish friends uh, swimming around. So we'll pop on over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium, um, a lovely, lovely chill place to visit for the end of our day 
I do want to say thank you to everybody who joined me today for the archival adventures. I hope I will see you for another archival, archival adventure in the near future. Um, and until I do, I hope you, you will continue exploring history.